Hey everyone, welcome to the next episode of Ecommerce Insights. I'm your host, Scott DeGrossier, founder and CEO of Wicked Reports. I have with us today a young gentleman with a very successful supplements business, Chucky Gregory. How are you doing today? Really good. How are you doing? Doing great. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your brand, how you built it, where you're at right now, and then we'll we'll get into our usual data media buying questions that we do. Cool, cool. Yeah. I mean, long story short, I've kind of always been an entrepreneur. For like the last decade, I had business where we were distributing snacks to convenience stores. And I got to a point where I was pretty, I pretty much had like freedom of time, but then I really wanted to have more of like freedom of location. I was kind of stuck in Indiana and I couldn't get out of that with that. My least business. favorite state. Yeah. <laughs> There's little, it's, it's the most boring state ever. It's completely flat. So yeah, we're actually moving out of Indiana to Florida or Texas eventually. I'm actually in Florida right now. We got here today for vacation. But yeah, so I wanted to create, I had in the back of my mind, I wanted to create a business that was online. Not sure exactly what that was going to be. But I knew I wanted to do something online and I knew I needed a problem to solve. So we, with our distribution business, we had to wake up really early all the time to, to run that. Like we had to start our routes about 4 or 5 a.m. So I kind of got in my head. I really wanted to solve how difficult it was to wake up in the morning, how difficult it was to wake up early. I wanted to create something we could call the cheat code to waking up early. Didn't know what that was going to be. Didn't know if it would be an info product, a supplement, who knows? In the end, it ended up being a supplement. The product's called the Early Bird Morning Cocktail. It's a product you make the night before. It, we sell it within a cocktail shaker cup, basically put a scoop with water, put on your nightstand, you wake up and you kind of start sipping on it from there. It's like a blood orange mimosa flavor, provides clean energy, mood boosting nootropics and electrolytes first thing in the morning. So we launched in November, 2019, kind of just had, we had 300 tubs that the manufacturer got us finally after a long battle and said, if we could sell that out, we would, that would kind of prove concept and we would turn into legitimate business. So we sold that out within a month and then have been just getting inventory selling out since then. And yeah, gotten to a point now where we're really starting to scale. I'm an open book. If you want to talk any numbers or anything like that. I'm not sure if you look at each uh, individual's <laughs> Wicked Reports numbers, yeah, you have access to all the cool data. But yeah, we've been really growing fast since like November and really starting to scale this year. The only thing that's held us back is how much inventory we've been able to get from our manufacturer. And we finally solving that and on our way to scaling pretty quickly. That's awesome. I mean, early, I mean, I'm drinking decaf right now, but I've tried the 5 a.m.s and I've fallen back to... Whenever my wife says, get up, <laughs> which is like 645. So that was tough. So when you, did you have any, how did you figure out what to put in that would work? Was it experimentation on yourself or how did, how did you get there? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we were trying all these different habits and stuff, just like put the alarm clock across the room. You know, we tried crazy things like even like sniffing salts that you see like NFL players <laughs> use to get like hype before a snap. So we were trying everything. And then I read in a book, I think the book's called On Your Day, On Your Life. And it was like kind of outlined the perfect day. And the per and his day started with what was called a morning cocktail, which was just like a glass of water on your nightstand with lemon and sea salt. So we were started doing that every morning and it was helping a bit. And then I was just like, man, what if this thing that I'm, this morning cocktail I'm already drinking had, you know, just everything that I needed. And mm -hmm. it was just really simple to do just one scoop. And it actually tasted really good. Because at the time, it tastes like drinking ocean water, it was really yeah. salty, and it's kind of gross. So that's where it kind of started. And then for like, about 18 months, we were, I just had all these ingredients, I would just order bulk ingredients. And we would just test on like me, I would test it on, you know, me, my wife and my buddies, I was always giving them new like, <laughs> concoction every morning. <laughs> so that was that was a, kind of a fun stage where it, that was like the more entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial stage where we're trying to like develop the product. And then at the end, we had a really good formula we were confident in. And then we, uh, you know, started con uh, contacting like supplement manufacturers to get this made because like a powdered tub 
where there's 45 servings in one tub, just one scoop each morning. So, yeah. That's cool. I, I used to do my own electrolytes. I had all the, the bulk bags and just would mix and match and yeah, some would be disgusting and other ones I'd be like, man, I felt great. Oh man, I don't remember how much I put in of all this different. I used to have all these baggies and dust all over my office. Yeah, so, <laughs> totally it's fun at first. It's fun yeah. at first and then like it, it loses its fun and it's just like pain in the ass to like yeah. mix all these different things and then you just stop doing it because it's just a pain in the ass. <laughs> so you're selling out a product. So what, what's the game? How are you attracting all these customers to sell out a product? What are you, what are you guys doing? So we try to diversify our traffic as much as possible. Our main bread and butter, like most brands, is probably Facebook and Instagram advertising. We're spending about 2000 a day on Facebook, Instagram right now, hoping to scale that pretty quickly here soon. And we, we have started finding a lot of success with Snapchat, doing Snapchat ads. The, the ads have to be totally different. It's a totally different audience and the messaging has to be different. But we've, had, we've, we've been getting some traction there. And then we do some stuff on Google, mostly just branded search and stuff. And we've been testing some YouTube stuff. Haven't cracked the code on YouTube. It's, I'm probably just going to find some, a Google ad buyer soon to just... You know, can of worms. Well, I get an app with Tom Breeze, who's the guru of YouTube, and the way he t- it was like a like a masterclass in a podcast. The way he set up how they do it was like you picture a video where your end state, how you're gonna look like, like the video has to focus on who the person is after they get the results, which would mm-hmm. kind of work with because the, the whole point of the early bird isn't like I like getting up early necessarily. It's this achievement and great feeling and feeling good about your day. So, so you start with the end result there. Start with then. the end result. That's what he said. So he's got an ad buyers club. That's pretty cool that I would recommend you check out. He's the yeah. wizard there. So that, that I, well, so I, there's a lot of talk of marketers of match the message to the market. And so is it different targeting people you're targeting in Snap versus Instagram, let's say, or is it just the type of uh, attention span of the people caused your advertising to change or what, how get into that a little more. That's really fascinating to me that Instagram yeah. and Snap would have different messaging that would work. Yeah. For audiences, it's pretty similar with like Google, the audiences is so hard to like master. I think that's why I was saying a media buyer for that, but with like Facebook, most people could have a lot of success with just like lookalike audiences. So Snapchat has something similar. It's called, it might be like similar to or something like that. I know Google mm-hmm. has similar to, but it, they have their version of lookalike audiences that, and that's been working well with for us. It's just the style of the creative has to be different. We've tried like our more professional, professionally done videos and just kind of transfer those to Snapchat. They didn't work. So the more organic, natural feel, just kind of selfie style video, just talking to camera, explaining the value propositions, explaining the benefits, how it works, and just really le- le- leaving them with a hook. You don't really even have to say much. I think our best ad is just like, hey, we discovered the cheat code to waking up early. Swipe up to learn more. It's like something <laughs> super simple like that, like, but it's super like native where it's just like selfie style video. Like if we had that professionally produced, People just tap right on to the next thing. Oh um, man, that's interesting. So. Well, that we also goes to, to show you got to test, right? You you think you got it solved and you only got to solve one little spot. You always got to test. Yeah. You know, never ends. Yeah. Because we could have wrote off Snapchat pretty quickly in the beginning when it wasn't just like, it just wasn't doing anything. But then we started doing more stuff like that and it's been working. You know, we're not seeing quite as high of returns. And in the only thing that sucks about it is it'll it'll kill your conversion rate if you're looking at your site-wide conversion rate because it's going to send so much traffic that it really cheap traffic and it doesn't convert as much but because it's so cheap you're still getting really low cost per acquisition numbers so it it ends up working it just kind of if you if you just got to look at the know the metrics that you're looking at really that's so, a great point. Yeah. Cause yeah. a conversion rate person would be like, the sky's falling. And as the brand, you're like, if I'm making more's coming in, than it's going out, <laughs> keep doing yeah. it. And if I not, used to obsess over that, that overall site conversion rate, but now I just like, I'm just in wicked reports, just looking at it more granular level. Like, is this ad from this network performing? And it's not really necessary to look at overall site as much. 
I've always thought that because with conversion rate, um, the conversion rate probably expert is Pep Laja. He he did this conversion Excel website. And I was in his very first training program. This was like 2012 or something. And they were always talking conversion rate. And I was always like, well, if the traffic is good, it, it, it might just be that you bought shitty traffic, <laughs> like cheap people that are sitting around on Facebook for six hours a day, instead of oh, hustling to make money, maybe they're an easier click to get and they have less funds because they're just sitting around on Facebook all day. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, and anyone that's ran like a traffic campaign will know that that's exactly how it is. Because Facebook knows who's, who can convert, who can just watch a video, who's going to just click over to your site and not buy. If you ask for traffic, that's what it gives you. I mean, we've done it. Just tons of traffic that just sits there. So now uh, pretty much all our campaigns now are just conversion campaigns. Just kind of tell Facebook what you want it to do. Yeah. Plus, once you've got enough, fed them enough data, they, they're better. They can only be as good as you can help them learn. Yeah. So that's sure. pretty sweet. So then how important is data to your overall growth strategy? And like, what metrics are you focusing on these days? Yeah, it's everything. I mean, because we're making all our decisions based on the data that we're seeing. And if we're not seeing the right data, it's, you know, we're just kind of doing nothing. We're just kind of twiddling our thumbs, just kind of guessing. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's been huge. And we, we kind of started to see Facebook attribution just kind of like all over the place. Like some days it's way over attributing and some days it's way under. Uh, we know we had a way better day than what it's saying just based on our Shopify numbers. So that's when we started looking at Wicked Reports because that was probably, you know, we're kind of still pretty new. I think it was January or February when we hopped on and yeah, it's been awesome just having really, just having data that you know is accurate. Well, because when I started it, the, the guy who first kind of his problem was like, he just wanted to be able to prove everything. Like, who was this sale? And I was like, well, if you want to do that, we got to start with the sale and look back. No one really does that. But I mean, I'll, I'll, something, do, something will and nothing did. Mm -hmm. So that's how it kind of got born was that um, I just had to create a necessity because I always liked the fact that Facebook and Google and, and you're doing Snap and then you're going to add YouTube. You get a lot of people that are all going to try to take credit. And so it's kind of tricky. Yeah. Believe. They all have a vested exactly. interest. <laughs> yeah. The, the linear view is absolutely a game changer. That is just awesome mm -hmm. that it actually is accurately putting attribution where it should be and dividing up the attribution rather than just Google taking credit, email taking credit, Facebook taking credit. It really humbles your numbers too. Yeah. It's like, you know, you look, you look at Clavio and you're like, dang, I'm killing it. But you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's it might not be as good as you think it is. <laughs> on certain things. Well, it always goes back to because email and text still convert, convert quite well at the bottom of the funnel on people that already know your brand and Google and Facebook take that credit because they're not built to not do that. <laughs> Why are they going to look yeah. in at your, yeah. at your text and see if uh, someone bought on text? They don't care. They just want you to spend. Yeah, That's exactly. How it works. So you've been around since 2019. So do you have a, is that a recurring product? Do you get on subscription or is it just you repurchase when you're out? So how, how we have it set up is uh, all the front end sales are to a one-time purchase. They purchase our package. So it comes with our tub, our 45 serving tub, our cocktail shaker cup. We include an ebook that's called The Perfect Morning Routine. It's kind of just all the habits that I think are really vital for a really good morning routine with the morning cocktail being the first thing and then free shipping. So that's kind of our package that we sell on the front end. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we have all these different touch points to make them aware and drive them to our VIP subscriptions that we do through Recharge. So that's most of our back end sales is through the subscription and everything on the back end is making them aware of that. So we do, you know, email, SMS, we do direct mail. So we'll have like a postcard go out a few weeks after a purchase. And then our best customers will have like this automated system that sends them a handwritten note. So having all those things going on and being able to track those is huge too. We, we have for SMS. Our, we're using PostScript right now for well, SMS. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've been, it's been really good. Attentive has been relentlessly get, trying to get us to transfer over <laughs> and they have some good, they have some good stuff there. So 
Yeah, that's something we're debating uh, between, you know, attentive and post scripts. But yeah. I see people post- have success with both. So I don't, yeah. I'm not sure. People seem to like so, both that use them. So far, our SMS strategy has been pretty much all post purchase. We have a, a program we call Get Shit Done Tuesday. It's like a, it's a text every Tuesday morning. It's like motivational inspiration that, you know, on the thank you page, we'll have them opt into that. And then we'll have some emails post purchase. But we get about a third of our customers to opt in for that to, for that weekly text every Tuesday morning. And then at the end of the text, we just kind of have a link to our VIP subscriptions. And then we'll also text them if we're doing any promos or any product launches or flavor drops. And yeah, that list can be really profitable. So customer lifetime value then it's be pretty high with these VIP subscriptions. I mean, because if the drink works, then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be drinking it for good. As long as you get into mm-hmm. that second purchase, you're, you're yeah. in business. So I got a lot of follow-ups on that because a lot of e-com brands trying to do recur, some are doing it better than others. This sounds really solid. What, um, so do you, do you factor that in when you're looking at a campaign or a channel's value? Or like, like what, how much profit are you looking to get by the first purchase versus knowing you've got a couple of recurs coming? Yeah, our, our, our goal is to just break even on the front end. Right now at the level we're at, we're, we're making pretty good money on the front end. Our goal is to kind of just scale it to the point where we're breaking even on the front end and we'll be happy with making the profit on the VIP subscriptions from the back end sales. And we also do, you know, flavor, new flavor drops every uh, like two months or so. Those will be huge. And then we're launching a new product in the summer that's called Nightcap. That'll be more like a sleep supplement focused on really high quality mm-hmm. sleep. So getting them, we'll, we're, we're going to be willing to break even just to acquire a customer. And if, if we could do that, we'll be in a good spot. Right now, we're, we're still making money on the front end, which is awesome. But we want to scale <laughs> up to the point where... You're failing. You're making money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we want to be acquiring. We should be able to acquire way more customers, and you know, really take advantage of the our ad spend. So that that's a true lifetime value approach, then. And then, so then, do you see which campaigns are the, how the ROI can go up significantly over time, or how off? What type of leeway do you give a, a of a top of the funnel campaign, knowing that you're just trying to break even? Those ones are break even as well even cold. Yeah. Even cold. Yeah. Even cold. Really. We, so we have like a set budget right now because we can't go over a certain budget just based on our inventory level. So right now at where where we're at, we're just like, what's working best and moving, moving budget to that. But what's really cool that I've found that I could easily see in wicked that I wasn't able to see before is how targeting different audiences and even different, our different ads affect average order value and lifetime value. Oh, over yeah. time. I thought they would all be really similar, but we found that, you know, cer- we have certain ads that target like an older demographic. And we have found that the lifetime value of those and the average order value, both of them are significantly higher than just, you know, our other advertising methods. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to start scaling into that more than anything. But yeah, I never even thought about looking at that like so granularly at a lifetime value. That's awesome. Now with Google, you said it hasn't been quite as strong. Have you been pushing the conversion data back in to Google? Because then their their lookalikes will get better. They're bidding. They've got like target ROAS bidding, but they need they need about 30 days. They say they only need a a couple days, but it it takes about a month and then they kind of can dial that in. I don't know. It sounds like you could yeah, do some damage we, there too. Yeah, we did turn that on recently. So hopefully when our the, those similar two audiences are mm-hmm. a little bit more established, that would be more effective. And because I think we could do really good on YouTube. Our demographic is there. Our, our audience is on YouTube. It's just a matter of one, having shown it to the right people and then having the right creative there. Um, so yeah, we switched to YouTube. I mean, we're not products couldn't be more different, right? But we started spending a lot more on YouTube just on podcast. So after the podcast comes out, we just start spending on the podcast a little bit. And then it's been, I mean, we have record months every month this year. So that's one of the, nice. one of the reasons. So it's, it's be worth doing that, man, that's fascinating. The, 
trying to, to buy to break even and you just do too good. <laughs> that's fantastic. I yeah. mean, so with the recur, you use recharge and that's working out well. And then how much um, is text? So you haven't really incorporated text to try to close lead. Is there any like lead gen you're doing or is there all pretty much free, you know, your, your offer? Have you had to capture the email address at all or has it been, you haven't even had to worry about that? Yeah, we do capture, we do have like a pop-up that captures email on exit intent. Anything other than exit intent, we found that kind of hurts our conversions just because our product takes so much education. So we send all our traffic to a sales page that we are constantly dialing in. Like we're always running a split test on that page. And that's where all our traffic, all our cold traffic is sent to. It tells our story, describes the benefit, how it works, and then shows the offer on that page. No, but that already <laughs> fascinated me though. Because yeah. like, rather than have like 20 different, I, I've made the mistake of getting excited about all these different ways we're going to make all this money. And then I have like way too much marketing going on. And my, well, my marketing director, you know, gets very frustrated. But just mm-hmm. trying to hone in on just two options, you can really, that click funnel scaled to like 20 million on one landing page. They yeah, know it's I'm crazy. Thinking. Like, <laughs> like you could do so much with one page, one product. Yeah, you don't need like this whole crazy store with all these different products and categories and everything. We've we've done everything we've done so far with one single product, one single landing page that we just obsess over and then you know constantly tweak it. So oh, yeah. that's a, that's a good lesson. So just exit intent because you're hoping they'll just get educated on that one page and it must you must get be able to get there pretty quick like how what's the video how long is that video on that page we actually we actually do all it's a written sales letter basically on that page we we had a video that pretty much said the same thing but we couldn't get people to really watch it they they would always scroll right past it and kind of go get right into our <laughs> you know written story so then we we tested just getting rid of the video and you know putting a picture there that added value and that that one out and then we moved the video to other parts of the page and eventually like it just worked out better just to not have the video at all i never page. watch we videos put, yeah <laughs> me either like, i always want to read i always want to read i can read faster why do i want to hear like yeah and it's let me know the benefits it's quite a long page too so the whole you know people aren't going to read i don't think that's entirely true if you can just hook them in and just get them to the next sentence and constantly just keep them hooked in and get them to the next sentence that's the way to go. But where I was going with that before is with the pop-up. Yeah, we found that anything that kind of interrupts that experience of like, because they're in the story, they're reading and you don't want to, we, we don't want to interrupt that at all. And we, we've tested that. We wanted to see, you know, if we put something in there, if they're pretty interested at this point, if we show them a pop-up, will it work? And it always has hurt our conversions, except for exit intent. So on exit intent, we'll, we'll ask for their email address there. And it, the exit intent pop-up converts at about 30 to 33% um, when it's shown. And it, it, it does pretty well as, as far as collecting email addresses. And then they'll go into what we call our buy or die email flow, where they either buy or they die. <laughs> <laughs> Do you retarget the list, the buy or die? Are you retargeting them at the same time? Like in a, Yeah. In a yeah. So we'll retarget them and... If they, if they got as far as adding a cart, adding a product to the cart, then they'll go into a different email sequence, talking that to them a little bit differently since they made it a little further in the process. But yeah, they'll get the emails. We experiment with collecting phone number too. If, if we did, we'll, they'll get, go into an SMS uh, uh, flow as well. Um, and then they'll get retargeting ads on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, if they're on Snapchat and you know, uh, some other platforms too. That we'll what is, um, who wrote that page? I wrote the page. But you get a side I, career here. Yeah. <laughs> All our e-com brands would be like, hey, we need a page. <laughs> I should have just hired a copywriter. I don't know. It, I obsessed over that page for so long and just kind of like read all the best sales letters and all the copywriting books. I thought that that would probably be, be like the most important skill to learn. And it has turned out pretty useful. I still write a lot of stuff. I email the list twice a week, just like regular broadcast emails. Looking back at it, it might've been better just to hire a really skilled copywriter than to spend all that time <laughs> writing that page. But I, I disagree because if you have a page that sells so well that you can't, you run out of inventory. 
Yeah. That's, that's, that's success right there from what I, what I would say. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's changed a lot too, since we launched just experimenting with shorter form, longer form, just a little tweak here, a little tweak there. And so I think that's the key is always testing your ads, but never forgetting that increasing your conversion rate on a sales page will make your ads perform way better too. Mm -hmm. So what was the, I mean, so that was pretty fast, like two, what, two years, just under two years. Yeah. Most of the growth has happened since about June, really. Uh, most of, most of our um, scaling has happened since June and we've yeah. you know kind of taken off from there. So what was the, what was the biggest surprise out of all your data? So you, you very data centric here. What was the one that jumped out at you that something you assume that you were way off on that the data corrected you? I think seeing the, the, like the lifetime value from the ads kind of changed my perspective on things because with wicked, when they, when they buy again, it still attributes it back to that ad. So seeing that and then looking at the um, lifetime value, new customer like cohorts, that, that chart, that kind of opened my eyes to see what we can actually spend on marketing. Where if you're just looking at the front end, you're always just looking at that initial ROAS number and you're never really thinking beyond that. Seeing that has really helped open our eyes to how far we can actually scale this thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested in it. The product. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try it out. I'm awesome. a I, I don't do any supplements right now except for some green juice that works out pretty well, but I'm a, I love them. I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I'm just waiting to get excited about something. This is it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I'll try it out. Hey, it well, works. Our customers love us. Uh, I, what, what's our favorite thing is just seeing all the reviews. We have like a reviews flow and we've been we just get so many awesome reviews coming in from customers. And I think that's helped us out more than anything is like once we actually started getting a lot of good testimonials and good reviews and the user generated stuff has just kind of taken us to the next level with that. And we've been like moving our review section on the page up and down and testing different mm -hmm. areas. And every time we move it higher, it wins. <laughs> people <laughs> love reading like what other people's experiences are. So yeah, it's been that's been really cool. I think, you know, push for as many user generated things as you can and, you know, really push for those, you know, reviews. Yeah. Hey, this was awesome. Time flew by here. Thanks so yeah, much for, for sure. coming on. This is like super educational for people. So I'm psyched awesome. you're on. Thanks so much. Cool. All right. Awesome. Take it easy. Thanks, man. Bye. See ya.